Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to the Megan Kelly Show and happy birthday, Linda. My mom officially turns 82 today. She's here with us. We're gonna have a great day and uh, just so happy and grateful to have her here in all ways. Um, there's plenty to get to today. President Biden is in Lithuania for the NATO summit days after he said Ukraine. And by the way, just happened to casually mention the United States are running low on ammunition. Wait, what? What? <laughs> we are? Because that's kind of a problem. Is that real? Uh, we'll get into it. And the Secret Service will hold a briefing about the White House cocaine matter on Thursday morning. What does that tell us? That they have now scheduled a briefing on cocaine White House for Thursday morning. Uh, we'll also take a look at some of the other 2024 presidential candidates, including the controversy surrounding Robert F. Kennedy Jr., a topic our guests today are fired up about. Joining us now for the full show, Camille Foster, partner at Freethink, journalist Michael Moynihan, and editor-at-large for Reason, Matt Welsh. They are the hosts of the Fifth Column podcast, which you can find and support on Substack at We the Fifth. Dot substack dot com. Hey, subscribe to the show on YouTube and follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Look, you did the tough thing during COVID. You paid your people and pulled your business through the pandemic. And now doing the tough thing could qualify you for up to $26,000 per employee at covidtaxrelief.org. These funds are sitting there right now. It's not like you're going to have to go pinch our government for more money. It's already been allocated. The only question is whether you qualify, all right? They are available to reward companies with two or more employees who stayed open during COVID. It's not a loan. You don't have to pay it back. The program's a little complicated. No one knows more about it, about it though, than the CPAs and tax experts at covidtaxrelief.org. You pay nothing up front. They do all the work and share a percentage of the cash they get for you. Businesses of all types, including nonprofits and churches, can qualify, even those who took PPP loans, and even if you had increases in your sales. You did the tough thing for your employees during COVID. Now let covidtaxrelief.org help get you up to $26,000 per employee. Visit covidtaxrelief.org, covidtaxrelief.org, covidtaxrelief.org. Guys, welcome back to the show. Great to have you. Thanks, Thank man. you for having us. Happy All birthday, right, Linda. So Yes. Yeah. Happy, happy birthday, birthday, Linda. Linda. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm yeah. so happy. She's she's doing great. And it's a, it's such a, it's so great to, you know to have your my my dad died when I was young and it's just so wonderful to spend time with her and she's still hilarious. She's so funny. I told the audience a month or so ago she visited me back at home in Connecticut. She was playing it was either trouble or sorry with my two boys and uh, I hear from the next room from my mother, 82 year old Nana. I hear her say, um, "I'm not going to give you the finger." But I want to. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. okay. <laughs> Feisty. I think that That's... answers my question about whether we can work blue with your mama. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're good. We're totally good. Um, now, you cannot, however, talk about Joe Biden's seventh grandchild because you may offend the ladies of The View. Even if you are the revered Maureen Dowd of The New York Times, liberal columnist who most on the left absolutely love, and she's a must-read columnist. And uh, she wrote a piece over the weekend about the seventh grandchild saying, Joe Biden's being a douchebag. <laughs> it's not, not exactly what she said. <laughs> you know, it's my take on it. And um, she wrote about how she's got a sister who's a conservative and how she and her sister usually disagree on all things political. But on this, they were in agreement. And the headline of the piece was, it's seven grandkids, Mr. President, meaning not six, as he says. And she says, look, this is not a political issue. It's a human one. What you're doing to this little girl is wrong. She knows you're her grandfather. You won't acknowledge her. And you continue to point out over and over, I have six, six, six grandkids. And we all know it's seven. So that was a couple days ago. But then the ladies of The View took this up yesterday. And here's how that went down. 
President Biden doesn't need to overstep his son. I like that part, but mm-hmm. I don't know why they go out of their way to say six grandchildren or four kids. When my parents talk about me, they say, we love all our kids. We love our grandbabies. I've never seen them numerically repeat over and the over. Re- I like re- three kids. I like four of no, this. I like, re- this. Re- I like this. I like this. The reason that's happening is because the right wing, who again is weaponizing everything related to Hunter, keeps asking, so how many children do you have, Mr. No, it's very grandchildren do you have? It's written. How many? It's well, speeches well, he delivered. Maybe they Maureen Dow should find something else to write about. Yeah, so they write about that. something else. Yeah. They I, I really, about, I, I'm sorry. You know, these things are, for me, when you start talking about people's families and what yeah. they're doing, it's, I, I find it unnecessary. This is not anybody's business. Nobody needed to know about this. No. This is private. It's private, and Maureen Dowd needs to find something else to write about, guys. Do you agree? Not even a little bit. I mean, Joe Biden had the opportunity to remain a private citizen and not have his personal life scrutinized and have there be public questions about his relationships with his children and his grandchildren. Um, Unfortunately, or fortunately, if you like him, he decided to run for office and he won. And now people are asking completely legitimate questions. And quite frankly, it sounds like, based on the reporting that I've seen, um, that his, his team are the ones who are particularly concerned with the numbers that are used when talking about the grandchildren, saying that there were six and not seven, and insisting on that on that being the way to respond. Um, I, I heard someone in that clip say that Joe doesn't want to overstep his son with respect to the relationship with his grandchild. I could certainly appreciate that there are some ways in which my mom and my mother-in-law, both of whom I love dearly, uh, kind of they 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 talk to us when they're having these interactions with our children, but I am trying to imagine a universe where either of them would be put in a position where they wouldn't go out of their way to try and have a relationship with a child that happened to be their grandchild, even if my wife or I didn't have the the. The, uh, I'm looking for the right word because the things that I want to say uh, might actually offend certain people's sensibilities. Um, but I mean, Wait, there's just when so does much, that stop there's you? so little integrity on display <laughs> by people since who, when does that stop you, Camille? Uh, go, go ahead and offend. Let's hear. That are appropriate to help kids. Um, I look. I understand that this woman is a stripper, the mother of Little Navy, who is the granddaughter, and uh, he Hunter said she's not the dating type. And I've got to be honest, if if one of my boys, when they grow up, has a one-night stand and impregnates a woman and then the, doesn't want, you know, to be actively involved in the child's life, and I say, please do, please do, you made the baby, you have to go be a responsible parent, and then they say, I'm going to pay child support for this child and I'm going to sort of live up to my financial and legal responsibilities, but I am choosing not to have an active role in the child's life. I don't know. I think I'd stay out of it. But I'm not Mm. the president of the United States running around touting to everybody how important family is, how my grandchildren are the most important things in the world to me, and knowing that the grandchild that's out there knows I'm the grandparent and that I've made a decision to actively ignore them. I mean, this, this circumstance is just so unique and full of problematic elements for this particular little girl. Um, that they're going to have to deal with it. You know, the child doesn't exist and I only have six is not going to cut it, Moynihan. No. Um, you know, Megan, I say this every time I come on the show because it happens every time. And I want to say it again. Uh, and I want to upbraid you. I want to denounce you for making me <laughs> interact with The View, yep. which is something that I only <laughs> do on The Megan Kelly Show, one of the greatest <laughs> programs in I'm Christendom. Confident of it. True, <laughs> but I don't care what the lady from Sister Act says about journalism. <laughs> this is what we should talk about. And then Anna Navarro, who wasn't she a conservative at one time? And now she's at talking about point. how the right wing keeps on making it. Who are these people like popping up out of the bushes in the Rose Garden of the right wing saying, hey, how many kids you got? No, this is happening. <laughs> 
in briefings and and Karine Jean Pierre, one of the worst press secretaries in in uh, American history, uh, is a very bad job of responding to this stuff. If they had a better job, then maybe we would be asking fewer questions. But here's the thing: Hunter Biden has tied himself up with his father in so many possible ways. He's made themselves a unit because all of his business transactions, he can drive 176 miles an hour in a Porsche because he can afford a Porsche because of his father. He has no skills that we can we can see. He's a painter, apparently, and an exceptionally bad one. And he sells these things for five hundred thousand dollars because he's Hunter Biden, the president's son, not because he's a good artist. He is not an energy expert in the Ukrainian energy sector, nor is he in the Chinese energy sector. But yet he has these jobs. And then when he's texting people about them, he says, you know, my dad is sitting here right next to me and he's at the White House all the time. You know, you kind of tie yourself up with the president of the United States. And in the process of that, you leave a laptop somewhere. And in the messages of that laptop, you have the woman who, by the way, in these messages actually sounds totally reasonable. She's like, hey, I get mm-hmm. that you don't want to talk to me. I get that this, and he's just not responding. And beyond mm-hmm. anything, we can just say the president's son is a total rat bag. We don't have yes. to say that this is relevant. It's not a campaign issue, but he's a bad person. So let's just establish that. But when the president then denies all of this, I think what this is, is a class issue. And Megan, you brought up the fact that she's a stripper. That seems to be in the front of the mind of all of these people. If she was a congressional aide to uh, Chuck Schumer or something with a rising political cl- career, I suspect they'd probably have a different uh, response to it. But this working man of the people, the one who takes the train back to uh, back to uh, uh, Delaware and then you know Scranton Joe, doesn't want to have his uh, family soiled by this uh, horrible woman who, as you point out, his uh, repulsive son said, is not the dating kind, much less the marrying mm-hmm. kind. I, should, I guess she's a former stripper. I don't know the nature of their relationship, yeah. but- She has a kid. You know, I mean, yeah. look, there's no debating Hunter Biden did the wrong thing in when this woman got pregnant, just totally abandoning all of his responsibilities, you know, denying paternity. She had to take him to court. Even once it was proven, he tried to weasel out of it. He hasn't wanted to spend one dime on this baby that he helped create from the moment the baby was conceived. Um, And now is even trying to get out of living up to his full obligations by offering her the damn paintings he's come up with instead of actual cold, hard cash from Burisma. That's abuse. (laughs) <laughs> right. So there's no there, that's a no, that's a no brainer. But it does get more interesting when you say, all right, you know, let's say you, Matt Welsh, prior to being a happily married man with the, all the children and all that, happen to have an interlude with a woman who didn't mean anything Ooh. to you. Some people make that choice to do. And um, she wound up pregnant. And you said, OK, I'm going to pay for the baby. I'm going to, you know, but you didn't want anything to do with this woman. And this woman lived across the country. And you really didn't want to sort of be actively involved in the baby's life. Does How do you see that, that judgment morally? Because we'll start there and then we'll layer in the fact that it's Hunter Biden and it's Joe Biden, the sitting president of the United States, and the baby's going to know who all these people are. I am absolutely disgusted with hypothetical Matt Welch for uh, <laughs> even, even one from having sex with his gross. Um, but uh, but also for even thinking for a second about not taking full responsibility for parenthood. I just don't it, 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 it it's so foreign to me. I'm mean, all three of us are fathers of girls and Camille's got a, a little problem boy, too. Um, and it's like just the, the notion that you would you would deny a creation that you're part of. I don't I just don't understand it. It, it, it feels so skeevy and gross. And to Moynihan's point, when and also, you know, your your question about thinking about in terms of the president of the United States, Joe Biden has been with us uh, or against us, but he's been in public life for 50 years. He didn't just Mm -hmm. make that choice, you know, four years ago. He's been making that choice over and over and over again. I saw a funny tweet from Caitlin Flanagan. Someone's like, hey, when's the uh, when's the proper time for Biden to say that he's not running for president that to drop out of the race? And she said 1987 um, <laughs> 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 it was the proper time. And it was the proper decision back then, back when we cared about uh, politicians absolutely plagiarizing their own life stories uh, as he mm. did. And that's why he had to drop out. But he's had this this lunch bucket Joe persona. 
he's been talking about and weeping about, and I presume most of the time weeping real tears, but about his family. It's been part of his selling proposition that he is a family man. How many times do we have to hear about my old man said people just don't, they don't need a hand up, they need a middle out or something. It, like it doesn't even make sense anymore, but he'll bring mm. up his family, he'll bring up his kids, his son who died. Uh, he'll bring this up over and over again. And to have this person who's just a regular guy, he's just there on the beach in Delaware like anybody else, kind of stumbling around in the sand and isn't that charming um, to deny a, a, a kid that exists that is your uh, grandchild is is so beyond gross. Um, it's not the most important thing about Joe Biden. It's true. Um, but to the mm -hmm. extent that he's in public life um, and that he has sold us on this persona, which has always been a bit ersatz, uh, as all political personae tend to be, um, and to do this, and there's a human being at the end of this who is blinking at the television, um, being you know uh, the opposite of dead named, or I guess that might even be dead named. You're just not being uh, recognized as a member of the family. It just uh, it, it fills me full of revulsion at professional politics even more than I already always am. Yeah, the, um, the the fact that he went into court, Hunter Biden, to make sure that this little girl couldn't use the Biden name is pretty stunning. I mean, I can't, like, how yeah. can a judge order that she can't use the last name of her father? I mean, that it's so, but that's how important it was to him to, to put I mean, this he kind uses of the last name of his father all the time. That's how he makes money. <laughs> Right. That's exactly. That he, yeah. he doesn't afford I mean, his yeah. child the same opportunity. You really be very way, beneficial. You know, one final thing is that when you when when you see these you know half wits on on uh, the View saying that one cannot the family is off limits. I would like anyone to spend five minutes in the archive and see if they talked about oh, Trump's sure. kids at all. I suspect yeah. they yeah. probably did. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I mean, right. I, I grew. I don't have much relationship. Didn't have much relationship with my biological father. I mean, it's, a, it's the sort of circumstance where I would occasionally get birthday cards, which is to say, twice in the forty odd years that I've been alive, um, and in both instances, my name was misspelled. Like it's that sort of oh. relationship. Um, the the decision that one makes to distance themselves from their offspring to not make it a point to have to try and have some sort of meaningful positive impact on their lives um, i think is astoundingly awful it is among the most terrible things that someone can do in my estimation um, i think a grandparent has about as much right and in my in my from my perspective obligation um, to try and sow into that child's life and i don't i don't know that i could give Joe a pass for kind of backing his son here. I think the thing that Joe could do for his son that would perhaps be useful considering Hunter seems to run away from responsibility and make any number of other sort of poor judgments um, is model what it looks like to try <laughs> and be a good parent, to make this about the child and not the, the mother of the child if they do in fact have an issue with her to move beyond politics. I think there are ways for them to message around this publicly and ways for Joe to thoughtfully um, be a part of this child's life um, and just be a grandfather. Um, mm. Again, just beyond politics, beyond any other consideration, there's just something very fundamentally off um, about the decision-making that's happening here. And I get that he's an old guy and he's back at his son and he perhaps wants to respect that relationship. But I think there are ways to navigate that that don't involve pretending, masquerading, as though you do not have another grandchild, as though there's no issue here. And um, without any I mean, consideration for how this will impact this young woman's development. There's no shame in having little Navy Joan come visit the White House and None. meet her grandfather. And it doesn't necessarily have to be with all the other six grandkids if you've chosen not to have that relationship. But there can be a direct relationship that's appropriate. And, you know, you don't have to put her on display. You don't have to make a PR event out of it. You shouldn't mm -hmm. make a PR event out of it. But just some sort of nurturing of the relationship so she knows she's valued, despite the fact that she was born out of wedlock and her father's obviously a hot mess of a man. And the mother's got, you know, I don't know what the mother's past is. Former stripper doesn't tell us all that much. But I will mm -hmm. say this. This is, you know, I as I said at the top, I don't know. If I were the grandmother and my child had chosen not to have an active role in such a child's life, I would not approve of it but I would not overrule yeah. the child. Like I would not go around my own child's decision to have a direct relationship. But you think about what Maureen wrote, 
which, which really gets at the special situation here of being Joe Biden and Hunter Biden. And she says this, um, this little girl has Biden blood running through her veins and all she's going to have as a reminder of this are some of Hunter's original paintings. Sounds like a lousy trade-off if you ask me. As she grows up, knowing that her father and paternal grandparents wanted nothing to do with her, there will be plenty of schoolmates to remind her that she mm. wasn't wanted. Kids can be mean that way. And she says, Mr. Mm. President, many years ago, you lost your daughter in a horrendous car accident. Please do not throw away your granddaughter. This is from the draft letter that Maureen's um, conservative sister wrote to Joe Biden that you know persuaded Maureen as well. That he's, they're, they're doing the wrong thing. Today, there was some, some wavering on it. There was a report about Hunter Biden now potentially going, he's going to see her. I don't know what the, but at this point, it's almost pointless because anything they do from this point forward will be just to, to politically assuage Maureen Dowd and her sister and the like, right? It's not, none of us I is going to believe that. Politics is such a warping thing, isn't it? I mean, imagine that your life is completely governed by political instincts, every single decision. I mean, this happens to families that are political families. When Ted Kennedy drove off a bridge in Chappaquiddick in Martha's Vineyard and Mary Jo Kopechny was desperately taking her last breaths, when he got to safety, he was thinking about his political career and he didn't call the police because mm -hmm. politics dominated everything. When politics takes over your life like that, it makes you an immoral creature because politics is not a place for people who have normal morality. And when you have somebody in your family, if it's a, if it's a son, if it's a, I mean, look, I, 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 you know, kind of grimace at even saying this is that, you know, his invocation of his son in his son who died in political context, repeated political context, I find very unseemly too. He does because it when politics, a lot. Again, when it, when it takes, it takes over every part of your life, it you know, really intrudes upon normal human reactions to things. And when the political consideration is first, you're doing something wrong and you have to step away from it. Mm, well said. All right, wait, when you bring up um, Ted Kennedy, let's talk about his nephew who's running for president right now, RFK oh, Jr. Right? Sorry about Ted that. Kennedy's, <laughs> Ted Kennedy's brothers, so many Kennedys. Ted Kennedy had many brothers, one of whom was president of the United States, John F. Kennedy, one of whom was attorney general of the United States, Robert F. Kennedy. And that man's son is RFK Jr., who's now running for president of the United States. So many Kennedys, so little time. And uh, RFK Jr., or RFKJ, as I call him, is polling at, it's like 10, is it, is it 20%? Right. 15%. It's, like, oh, it's, it's almost 20%. Percent. It's almost 20%. I mean, that's, that's amazing. That's where Ron DeSantis is. I mean, my God, think of it. That's what a strong challenge he's posing on the Dem side. But the party, of course, will squash him like a bug. They won't let him debate against Joe Biden, who clearly is the front runner and has got some 66% in terms of being the next nominee. We'll see. I mean, I, it's not that anybody's rooting for this, but something could happen to Joe Biden. And if RFK Jr. were challenging Kamala Harris, we might see a very different reaction from the Democratic National Committee and Democrats writ large. I don't know what could happen, but the answer is anything in politics these days. So he's getting more and more traction and people are taking a closer look at him. And I know you guys are not huge fans, I think it's fair to say, of <laughs> RFKJ. Um, so I would love to talk about this with you because I, I, don't, I don't know that much about him. Um, you know, we did a very challenging interview, which we've touched on a little bit with you guys on his stance, not in particular on COVID vaccines, but more his vaccine skepticism on a larger scale. The questions he's raised about the MMR vaccines and, you know, sort of bigger vaccine questions. And then we did a deep profile of his his personal life and his, his life as a Kennedy, which was actually really interesting. Anyway, you guys, I'm Matt Welsh. I read your piece not long ago talking about like, how you think people are sort of missing the story on RFKJ, these new like Republicans who love his anti-Fauci stance and his anti-military industrial stance. You might be missing a few things that are relevant to RFKJ and also the fact that he's running as a Democrat for a reason, as some of these prior positions make clear. He's got a career as a dot connector 
um, which is the friendly way of saying conspiracy theorist. But I, I think actually dot con- and he's used that phrase. I think he even used that phrase on your show. He's like, maybe I'll connect some dots over here about why Tucker Carlson was fired by Big Pharma, which mm-hmm. I went and w- wasted a lot of time to look into just because as the exercise, like, OK, it might be plausible. Let's look into it. And it was bonkers uh, as a, as an accusation, um, uh, I think. Why? Um, and um, why? Because- I, wanna, I want you to let you finish your point. But just why do you think that's bonkers? Um, it rests on a conversation that he allegedly had with Roger Ailes, with whom he had a really interesting, weird relationship. They made a TV show together or worked on one in the, in the mid 1970s. Um, it it's bonkers because there's no other reporting anywhere to suggest this. Uh, Tucker Carlson has been going against Big Pharma and talking about Big Pharma, as have several other Fox anchors before, during, and after the time that Tucker Carlson was fired. Like literally the same week. Um, the, the accusation from RFK Jr. was that Tucker finally crossed this line that you cannot cross in American politics to say that pharma is this malevolent force that influences too much in media and they kind of dictate and call the shots and make people write about uh, or, or broadcast things that are pro pharma at every step. OK, um, so uh, if he crossed that line, uh, how is it that all of these other people who work at Fox continuously cross the exact same line and that Tucker had crossed that line several times in the past and it was never a problem. Um, meanwhile, you have all of these other absolutely contemporaneous things um, that okay. are factors, Fair are, enough. Are very uh, uh, potentially plausible factors in Tucker Carlson's separation with Fox. Um, so okay. there's no evidence to support it. Even the amount of advertising that that Fox News gets from Big Pharma compared to other people or from from Pfizer and people who had uh, skin in the game in terms of the COVID vaccine is not as much um, as other networks. It just doesn't it doesn't make sense. It doesn't pass Ocom's razor. And then all of the supporting evidence that you would think that would bolster that evaporates upon contact. And this is what happens repeatedly when you look into Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s claims about anything. And I've only looked into about a half a dozen of them. Um, they just dissolved. He uh, uh, made two different, completely long um, uh, accusations about who really killed Martha Moxley, because it obviously wasn't his cousin. Uh, and one time it was it was uh, wait, definitely uh, going to be these. Wait, 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 wait. I yeah. know who that is. Uh, and you know who that is. But a lot of our <laughs> listeners will not have any idea who Martha Moxley is. She was this a little is the problem with RFK. I have to like learn things about the Kennedy family, which I've spent my entire <laughs> oh, no, life this trying is a fascinating, not to know anything about. <laughs> this is a disturbing <laughs> and fascinating crime, but I love true crime. And I think a lot of our audience knows that. But Martha Moxley was killed in the early 1970s in a Tony suburb of Greenwich, Connecticut. Um, and it was said, and ultimately this person was tried, that a someone related to the Kennedys did it. Um, uh, Michael Skakel was the name of the boy who was ultimately, as later as a man, arrested and convicted, but then the conviction was thrown out years later. For the crime, Skakel is part of the Kennedy clan. Skakel's mother was... Um, okay, hold on. I'm trying to remember. So RFK <laughs> Jr.'s mother is Ethel Kennedy, but her maiden name, his RFK Jr.'s mom, who married RFK, her maiden name was Ethel Skakel, and her <laughs> brother is the father of Michael Skakel, who got accused of killing this young girl. So they're first cousins, is the bottom line. RFKJ and Michael Skakel are first cousins. And Michael Skakel, who was 15 years old when this little girl got beaten to death the night before Halloween in this suburb by a golf club, they never, they didn't make an arrest for years and years, ultimately as, as like a grown man got arrested and tried and convicted and then ultimately was thrown out and they chose not to retry him at that point. He'd already served, I think, 10 years. Go ahead. Yes. So bludgeoned to death, a brutal murder, uh, golf clubs, Halloween night, I think it was. Um, and so he wrote, uh, and Bobby Kennedy and him were, were very good friends, very close growing up. Um, and I get defending your cousin and also thinking that he didn't do it. What I don't get is that um, he wrote a 2003 Atlantic magazine piece about 50 trillion words long, um, as he <laughs> tends to do in his pieces that eventually, in many cases, be, get retracted by their original sources. Um, and in that piece, uh, he accused- wait, Let's talk about that. Let's talk about Because there was one infamous incident with Rolling Stone, which we can get into, but I don't know right. what, what other ones you're referring to. Uh, salon.com. Salon too, yeah. uh, same. That well. was the he same. That was the, same reporting. Um, what's that? Salon.com had the same retractions based on the the Rolling Stone piece. So that that's all one uh, incident. 
There's there. I believe there's two incidents. One is a uh, vaccine related. And then the other one was about the uh, election being stolen by the GOP in 2004. 2004. Um, OK, uh, which was eventually retracted by Salon.com. I, I, I think I, I think that's the, the the chain. But both of those things were heavily contested at the time um, and either uh, a series of corrections and then retractions afterwards. The okay, but I will say I'm for the record, the big stuff. one that people use against him is the Rolling Stone article, which came out about right. whether mm-hmm. vaccines have any role in causing <clears throat> autism. And everybody uses that and says, Rolling Stone had to retract your big article. And we took a deep dive on that before he came on. We looked at the four things that led Rolling Stone to with, withdraw or retract the article. And and two, I think two out of the four went in our case favor. If anything, they had understated the risk and they corrected it after the so that and the others were not did not get to the central piece of whether vaccines could play any role in autism. I'm not saying vac- vaccines cause autism for the record. I will just give you my opinion as a reporter and somebody with no dog in this hunt. When I looked at the Rolling Stone correction that had been cited by everybody to discredit the guy, I was like, eh, this is it. This is the stuff that led to the retraction of this article. I'm not persuaded. So anyway, okay, got it. And the Salon thing, he did claim that the 2004, not 2000, 2004 election was was stolen stolen by the GOP. That's a different story. Keep going. Yes. So so you looked into at least one of those. I've looked into like four of them and to my satisfaction and everyone should have their own sense of satisfaction. But there's other people who've reported on the Martha Moxie story who've retraced his reporting as they did in the salon.com in the 2004. People who had covered the election dis- uh, irregularities or alleged irregularities uh, in uh, Ohio, which is where his uh, thing was based on. And in, there's a pattern in each one of these cases. When there's a local reporter who has been covering the same exact things, then retraces his steps, I have found every single time that I've looked in it and uh, that his steps are terrible. He takes shortcuts constantly. He leaps to conspiratorial conclusions. He connects dots. That's what he does. Um, and so I, as someone who is a journalist, I don't let have a campaign to discredit RFK. I think it's ridiculous that anyone tries to deplatform him. I think YouTube kicked off a Jordan Peterson interview with yeah. him th- this week. That's ridiculous. Don't do it. I think he should be at debates. I'm grateful that he's running. I think more people should run and that if more people ran, he might not have 15% or maybe he would have more. We don't know. I think deplatforming is wrong. I think I love political competition. Trust me. I'm just looking at this from the perspective of someone who's interested in journalism more than I'm interested in how mad I am at the elites. And people who okay, but let me been, let me ask you this. I get, I take all of that. And I know you're uh, good faith on everything, and always super researched and and well informed in your opinions. But I will say that what I see people doing with him is they just take like their favorites and they tick them off. Like they'll say, oh, you know, vaccines cause autism, which is not what he said. He said that our children are are swimming in a toxic stew, and I think the v- vaccines may play some role in causing not just autism but ADHD and ticks and all these other things. Um, mm-hmm. and, and we can get into, you know, all of that. that. That's what we did the long episode on. Are they, are they playing some role? What's the evidence of it? And we got very, very deep in all that. But I think there's sort of from others, uh, like a laziness to just sort of tick these thing, things off. Whereas some of them, like I could debate the Martha Moxley case with you. I think Michael Skakel did it. 100%. I think Michael Skakel killed Martha Moxley. He was a weird guy. He was said to have done animal torture. Hello. All of those people turn out to be killers. He was jerking off in the trees, watching her. I mean, oh, like geez. that's, yes, it's a whole Thank thing. Um, Happy birthday, um, mom. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <gosh>. <laughs> um, <laughs> but RFKJ said he had a witness, a friend of theirs, who said these two guys came into town that night and that they there were quotes from this other guy. His name was Tony Bryant. We looked it up. And this former classmates of Michael Skakel's, Tony Bryant said, I know that he didn't do it. I know who actually did do it. These two other guys, he named them. He described their direct quotes and how they were focused on Martha Moxley and how they killed her. Now, I don't believe it, but I don't think it's a conspiracy theory for RFKJ to say, this is a credible guy and I believe him and I know that my first cousin couldn't have done this. Well, uh, man, if I, can I chime in here quickly just sure, on, sure. on yeah. one thing is that, no, it, on its own, it's not a conspiracy theory. Um, you know, I've I read a bit of his thing. Um, I followed the Martha Moxley case um, when it was kind of revivified. And 
and um, Michael Skakel went to jail, but I don't, you know, remember all the details of it. And I, I think it's perfectly plausible that there's another explanation for this. We see this in, in a number of kind of true crime uh, cases. But the thing for me is that you finding patterns here. And the pattern mm-hmm. is that um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., um, lurches towards what people call the conspiratorial, and I think for good reason. In the conspiracy theorist is, um, you know, a slur, right? But it does actually make sense when every explanation for something that is actually not not proven, it's very hard to prove all these things, but when the opposite version or kind of the more conspiratorial one is the one that he always goes for. And a couple examples of this. Um, the CIA did not kill his father. I'm sorry, it, 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 I've looked into this more than any person should. I have read far too many books about it. Um, people make the argument about his uncle too. I don't believe that either. But I'm, you know, according to the American popular and, and, and you know, opinion polls, most people do, do believe that there is a conspiracy to kill his uncle. So he's not out of the mainstream on that one. I suppose I am. But that one, you know, so th- that was a conspiracy, the Michael Skakel one. Um, you know, his book about Anthony Fauci, a huge amount of it is about how HIV doesn't cause AIDS. Now, there are people uh, that do believe this, a very, very small minority. Um, some of them are actual scientists. And, you know, it's, it's, but it's a, it's a very, very minority position. And I find it very odd because, because um, RFK, when he was talking about climate change stuff, and remember, he became really a force in, in American politics and activist politics as an environmental campaigner yeah. um, when he was uh, saying that people should be prosecuted, uh, companies should be prosecuted, the Koch brothers should be prosecuted for Jailed, quote, unquote, denying right. climate change, something he is tried to start, I think, start walking back. Matt can, Matt can speak to that because I haven't paid too much attention to that. Matt actually was the one that dug up that clip. Um, th- the thing that I, I find weird about it is that when he's saying that, he says, look, all the experts agree. 90% of the experts agree. There is a scientific consensus. So there are times when the scientific consensus on this issue matters. The scientific consensus on you know vaccines, COVID vaccines, HIV and AIDS, he then throws that out the window. There's consensus Which we would all on agree who with. killed his father. He throws it out the I window. I mean, everybody, so I you, it's but kind you, of an odd you agree, thing. Moynihan. There's a conspiratorial thing to, to, I think, to I, his instincts. Take your politics. point. Take your point. I take your point. And it does tend to be that when somebody sees conspiracies over and over again, like they see them in everything. And we've seen that in people like yes. Alex Jones and others. Like sure. it's an it's a rabbit hole you can get sucked down fairly easily, especially okay. in 2023 America, especially, right? In, on the especially heels when of your this public health uncle, crisis. Uncle were murdered too. That can actually right. have an effect, I imagine. That, exactly yeah. right. But also, you know, for even normal people post- uh, January 6th, post-COVID lockdowns, post, you know, being lied to repeatedly by Anthony Fauci and others sure. like him, which we we know happened, right? And it's, it's just, and, and not to mention what the FBI and the DOJ have been doing. And like, I can see how his brand of, yes, he is more conspiratorial thinking, is becoming very appealing to a lot of people. And we've had people sure. on this show, Michael Shermer and others talking about, he's Skeptic Magazine, talking about how, you know, you've got to, really steel yourself against this because that kind of thinking can be very attractive and it can just, it can pull you in because it makes you feel like you're smarter than everybody. Correct. Like you're That's in exactly on right. it. Yeah. You know, you're in on, you're in, like the rest, nobody else gets it and you're in yeah. on it. Like I remember interviewing Alex Jones and he was saying all the crazy things about frogs and I was like, oh my Lord, this guy's a lunatic. <laughs> and then we went back and checked it and lo and behold, the son of a bitch was right. The, the frogs are turning female, like the water's turning frogs into girl frog, boy frogs into girl frogs. It's <laughs> happening. They're like trans frogs and they're gay yeah. trans frogs. I'm like, he's a lunatic. <laughs> it was true, but it doesn't mean it's happening to humans, right? It, there is a leap to be made there. That's what I want to <laughs> Telling you it's Megan, bizarre gay shit. Frogs. Let me just tell you. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> I, really, I, I went back to NBC and I'm like, oh, he's a lunatic. And then the yeah, NBC yeah. fact checking team came back. They're like, it's true. I'm like, oh my God. Oh my God. Yeah, but this all this stuff works. I mean, Megan, you know this. I I went down to Alex Jones's studio uh, right before the inauguration of Trump and and spent some time with him there. And you know, I mean, I found him a totally fascinating character, a very funny character. He was a great person to interview. Um, it was only when you did it that people got mad and said, "Don't platform it." When I did it, nobody gave a shit. So, <laughs> yeah, that's another term so that you hate. You hate about me than clips, about anything else. and you but hate the, the word thing about platform. Jones is that the the entire thing rests upon. Uh, stuff that does actually exist, right? I mean, it, it has to have some 
plausibility to it. Um, otherwise, you know, these things just kind of, you know, are dead on offer. And you're right about the fact that all of these things that have existed recently, but the thing about it is when it comes to the Fauci stuff, when it comes to the mass stuff, when it comes to, if you don't, um, if you get, I mean, look, I, I was watching the Wimbledon the other day and people were talking about Djokovic who was denied entry and kicked out of Australia for not having a vaccine. This was all based on the idea that being vaccinated prevented the spread. They're still having conversations about how Djokovic was insane to do that, despite the fact that we now know that the the idea behind that, the thing that under uh, was underlying it, was wrong. But the yeah. thing is, this stuff all eventually came out. The same thing is true of of the Russia nonsense and all the conspiratorial stuff that you still see on MSNBC and everything. But there, the, the thing is, is it, it's it's a very and Michael Shermer, I think, is great on this stuff. It's very tempting when so much of this stuff turns out to be bullshit to say that everything is bullshit, that everything mm. that you can possibly see is not, and that there are these elites and stuff. There are, but you know, it's not always the case that the CIA is going to kill your father or 9-11 was an inside job or HIV doesn't cause AIDS and it was a big pharma conspiracy. That stuff is very hard over years and years and years to keep, say, keep that hidden and keep that secret. I don't, look, we've gotten a lot of shit from our listeners who really like him and, and they like him for exactly what you're talking about. It is the instinct that unlike other politicians, he has the instinct to say, these people in power are full of shit and they're tricking you. It's like when people said about Trump, you know, the man talking about the working man is also a billionaire from Manhattan. The man talking about the shadowy conspiracy and, you know, these families that control the world is a Kennedy. I mean, it's rather funny that that's happening, but it also gives it an air of credibility and respectability. So I get the instinct and I get why people are mad at us, but I think that the things that he's right about, he's right about. But I think the whole package and particularly for people on the right, and this is the warning that I would give to people on the right, and I'm sorry for ranting about this, but the no, man okay. is still a man of the left. Ask him what he, he wants is. to do about uh, economic policy. That's what nobody cares about. They want to talk about the COVID stuff. I get it. I get it. This is a man who praised Hugo Chavez in 2008, 2009, very fulsomely, as did his brother, uh, Joe. Uh, this is not a guy that you want as a conservative. He will he will satisfy these and, and you know, hit all these erogenous zones of attacking <laughs> Fauci and these people that suck. And yes, yes, I get it. The whole package is not something that you want in the White House. I'm sorry to say mm. As an alternative to Joe Biden, though, he is very appealing. I mean, at least anything at is appealing. Least Hunter is appealing. <laughs> he, he's very smart. Hunter, twenty twenty four. Yeah, and the, I you think know, the he's only an thing honest I would man. add I don't to think, the litany. Uh, I don't oh. think he's a dishonest man. Go ahead, Camille. No, the only thing I'd add to the litany is with respect to to immunizations and pharma conspiracies. I mean, immunizations make up an infinitesimally small portion of total yeah. pharma profits. Like it seems rather odd to suggest that there is this broad conspiracy to destroy people who talk about um, uh, pharmaceutical uh, immunizations in particular in public and express express skepticism. I mean, the consensus in favor of them is pretty substantial, and the wow. revenue at yes. risk is not so enormous. Um, it just it just doesn't. But we wash. know we know they were they they were in favor of censorship. I mean that that doesn't mean they they ran around getting people fired, but I mean big pharma definitely wanted people silenced on these uh, negative side effects of the vaccine, for example. And then just to go sure. back even further, one of the things RFKJ is pointing out is that when um, that he calls it a gold rush when these vaccines first came out and became part of the mandatory offerings for young people and that they had to provide some sort of liability shield for them. And so the, it was like, they, they were delighted because they, they, they were mandatory. These guys were making them all and they were shielded from liability. And then people weren't asking questions about them and off to the races we went. And it's right around 1989. And then we saw this huge spike in autism. And so he, he when we had our interview, he was not saying, I am definitively saying that they caused the autism. And he had all of his kids vaccinated and his kids don't have autism. He, you know, he was saying, if you look at that point in time and you look at what was happening as an environmental lawyer, he was living it firsthand. Because I've heard, I think it was you, Matt, saying like, is this, the guy's 
he's not a doctor. One of you guys was saying he's not a doctor. How is he going to be advising us on all this? But he's an environmental lawyer. And trust me, as a lawyer who was a commercial litigator for 10 years, you do become an expert in this. So I, if there was a point at which I was an expert in retreaded tires, people, I could have gone down the highway and seen those like tires on the side of the road. And I could have told you, oh, that's that's by Bandag. This is what happened. Sure. They're like, uh, I, Bandag. I, you change it, Megan. <laughs> I was subscribed to Modern Tire Dealer, boys. So you do <laughs> become a bit of an expert. <laughs> Very anti-vaccination, but very strange. Page three girls are off the charts, though. <laughs> anyway, um, I don't know. I forget my point. But my point is basically, I think he is coming at it from an honest angle. Doesn't mean he's always right. And I think I take your point. I think it's fair that he sees a conspiracy in way more instances than those of us who would agree with him on Fauci um, and some of these other mm. things might might you know, fall into. All right, stand by. We have much more with the host of the Fifth Column Podcast. They're here for the whole show after this quick break. Like many people, I am trying to eat healthier these days. It's not always easy, but this is why I love good olive oil. It makes such a difference. And by good, when it comes to olive oil, I mean fresh. Olive oil packs the most flavor and the healthiest nutrients when it's fresh from the farm. And that is the problem with supermarket olive oils. They're not fresh. They can sit on the shelf for many months growing stale. That's why I like my olive oil direct from small, award-winning farms, thanks to a guy named TJ Robinson, also known as the olive oil hunter. When I first tasted TJ's farm fresh oils, I fell in love with their vibrant, grassy flavors. They are delicious on salad, veggies, pasta, meat, fish, you name it. As an introduction to his fresh pressed olive oil club, TJ is willing to send you a full-size $39 bottle of one of the world's finest artisanal olive oils for just one little dollar to help him cover shipping. Best of all, there's never a commitment to buy anything, and you can cancel your membership at any time. Get your free $39 bottle for just one dollar shipping and taste the difference freshness makes. Go to harvestfreshnow.com, harvestfreshnow.com for a free bottle and pay just one dollar in shipping at harvestfreshnow.com. Guys, um, our favorite podcaster and only our favorite podcaster, Chris Cuomo, is back at it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he's he's back at it. This is this is the best when he offers life advice. He let, you know, he, he's worried about you guys. He, maybe you're not finding the motivation you need to do well in this life and to get after it. And here mm-hmm. are his thoughts on that. Real talk. Oh, no. This is the reality. <laughs> All the people you see with the David Goggins and the self-talk and the embrace the suck and the stay hard and go get it, get after it. Even me, let's get after it. Sometimes you're just this, I don't want to work out. Maybe it's my uh, feelings of depression or whatever. I just don't want to do it. That's what this video is. Real talk, a little bit longer. And here's my motivation. I got you guys. So what do you do when you don't want to? You start. That's the hardest part. Get up. Don't give in to self-talk. <laughs> oh. Until you have to. I started at 237 a few months ago. Now I'm about Damn it. Uh, uh, <laughs> almost there. I think the almost where I want to be. You gotta do <laughs> the work. You gotta do the work. The grind is the glory. Easy to say. Hard to do. Just oh take the shirt God. off, bro. Oh my lord. I should tell uh, the listening many, audience, I, he did the first half of that with a pillow like over his face. Like, I'm so what? tired. I can't and you're then he showed us himself? his belly. Was yeah. <laughs> I, I, wasn't that, was there a camera? Because like, you know, we do this podcast and they're like, can you move your computer this way? Can you? He did the whole thing with a friggin' pillow on his face. I mean, I want to <laughs> see his face, but then he shows me his stomach. Pick one. Are you talking about Bilbo Baggins or whatever? Who the hell are these people? <laughs> Who's Doggins? I don't even know what this is. I love the guy that's giving me life advice who just got fired from like the best job of his life. Yeah. <laughs> it's like who I'm literally grew up in like this political royalty family who had everything handed to him. Like, could you stop? Just stop. He wants to be Oprah. Yes. Uh, but I Oprah mean, never put a pillow over her face in bed. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> or showed us her naked yeah, belly. Not on camera. Not on camera. Yeah. <laughs> I think that there should be a hard and fast rule of that men should keep their shirts on unless mm-hmm. they are a professional athlete 
um, or you know they're at Muscle Beach or something like that, and are at a respectable age. Any no, man- no, 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 Matt, you're wrong, and I'm going to tell you why you're wrong. <laughs> and this is going to maybe sound a bit, um, you know, I don't know how to say it, but um, I, I will say something in defense of Robert F. Kennedy. When he took his shirt off and was on mm-hmm. Twitter lifting weights, I was like, that is actually very impressive. Maybe he looked good. Did kill his father. Agreed. Because Agreed. that I was really <laughs> impressed by that. Because he's like seven, sixty-seven or something. 68? Sixty-nine. He's ripped. He was amazing. Super, super Jack. Yeah. I still don't need to yeah. see. Yeah. Put on a tight shirt. That had a point. (laughs) That had a point. I think he really was trying to show us how much younger and more vibrant he is than Joe Biden. This with Chris Cuomo has no point. I mean, he has a long at all to get that. (laughs) Chris Cuomo has a long history of trying to show us his muscle and like building his whatever. I don't know what. Like, and he he, if you listen to the whole video, goes on about the number of pull ups he did and the number of push ups he like who. Does that? What man does Chris that? Cuomo. <laughs> the answer is in the question. It's Chris Cuomo. I don't know why you watch this stuff. You watch The View and you listen to Chris Cuomo. It's Megan, my team. You're going to have some serious <laughs> mental health issues in the next like they, two years. They, How do you think they, she gets out of bed? With the, she got the pillow on? She got the camera person there? She needs. Yeah, to- I want to see Megan's version of that. Come on, guys. I got to get up. I'm like, I don't want to get out of bed because I know what my team has got for me in this hideous packet. The View and Chris Cuomo. No, it's, I love it. I love to laugh. And they, so, you know, the n- News Hounds, it was this organization that their motto was, we watch Fox so you don't have to because they, they live to hate yes. Fox News. That's my team. That's my, they, yeah. they live to watch Fox News and The View so you don't have to. We have to laugh. If we can't laugh at the news and each other. Then where are we, gentlemen? Then we are the ones showing off our news felt post 237 body in our <laughs> abdominals and we're flexing and we're flexing the other way <laughs> i gotta do one of those videos <laughs> i don't know i think it says something bad about certain other body parts that he doesn't want to talk about okay with that i'm gonna pause and go to break we'll be right back the guys from the fifth column stay with us and don't forget you can find the megan kelly show live on sirius xm triumph channel 111 every weekday Right? If you want to listen to the show live, you can do that starting at noon east. You can see all the video clips if you subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash Megyn Kelly. Ladies, do you see those dark spots in the mirror? You want help making them go away? Introducing the Dark Spot Corrector from Genucel, just in time for the summer. The Dark Spot Corrector, with not one, but three cutting-edge ingredients, goes to work fast to target sunspots, dark spots, liver spots, and even old discoloration, both on your face and your hands. You can now enjoy your summer sun, beach, and barbecues without those pesky spots. With Genucel, you will see results or you will get your money back, no questions asked. So go to genucel.com right now. Get your dark spot corrector with the new Genucel most popular package, all their best stuff, and now featuring summer essentials like the best-selling ultra retinol moisturizer, with a powerful retinol alternative for safe use in the summer sun. Genucel.com slash MK60 for these amazing summer essentials and save over 70% off, 70% off their most popular package. Free shipping, free returns, excellent luxury skincare, all at 70% off. Genucel.com slash MK60, G-E-N-U-C-E-L.com slash MK60. All orders include a mystery gift while supplies last. Genucel.com slash MK60. So um, we're, we're talking about Chris Cuomo and his naked belly. And I have to tell you, gentlemen, he may be onto something because the New York Times reports that, guess what's coming back? Crop tops for men. Crop <laughs> tops. <laughs> My hands, eyes I mean, are like silver dollars. I'm sorry, coming back? Was there a time coming. when that was a thing? <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Did I miss this the, memo? Well, the think- New York Times suggests it was big in the... 70s or 80s, I can't remember. Um, Here's what they say. (laughs) There are the more modest styles that hit right at your waistline, but many are cropped short enough to expose a navel. Like, to expose a navel, guys. Some are are wearing them by taking scissors to old T-shirts. Others buy them off the racks. Others from stores, women's sections. And they go on Hmm. to, to quote, man after man (laughs) after man. Look at this guy. Just like, look at oh. this. And I mean, yeah. listen, I'm going to be honest. My first thought was every single man that you're quoting in here is a gay man. There's no straight man yes. who would wear, right? No. I mean, there would, and yet, and yet, um, we go on to Cody James, 27, works in advertising in New York. 
said he grew up watching movies and TV shows from the 80s and the 90s and started wearing crop tops about a year ago. Mr. James said about 70% of the shirts he owns are cropped. Most, he added, hit below his navel, though a few are short enough to show it. Quote, my girlfriend, (laughs) oh, my girlfriend, always makes fun of me. What? What? (laughs) Because sometimes she just (laughs) wants a shirt to wear to bed, but they're all crop tops. I have Mm. bad news for the girlfriend. (laughs) Yes, your boyfriend's gay. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. That's not, I'd be not the that there was anything that wrong with that. Show. Nothing yeah. wrong with that. We celebrate it. I just no. you know you're being you're being. But tricked. your girlfriend might not celebrate it. Yeah, <laughs> but it's real. Uh, it's I, real I don't, because I don't believe this. I'm a crop top skeptic. I don't think this is a thing. You why? Crop top. It's a conspiracy. You don't think exactly. it's coming back? The question that I have to ask myself as a journalist and as someone who has gotten sources for stories, when you're doing a story about a crop top, how do you find the person who this guy, Cody, whatever, 27, who works at some ad agency and says, you know, I, I, I found my source. The man is 70 percent crop top. Matt, do you know how to do this? Do you, do you post on do you post on Twitter or something? Who's the who's the croppiest of the crop tops? In I, your go neighborhood? To I don't understand this. It's- you know, I, in fairness Insta. to the trend existing before, the trend did exist before in college football in the 1980s. Correct. Uh, you would wear a mesh crop top, like tailbacks yes. from SMU correct. would wear yes. a little crop, and then they look great because they were tailbacks and they were running over your face at 1,000 miles an hour, and it was perfectly fine. They had those little hit pads that would come up. Remember those? Um, mm-hmm. Sexy, all of it, but like nobody actually wore <laughs> crop tops um as the people super the 70s photos, sports for those of you wonderful. listening as i listen to megan the game megan kelly podcast on uh, a in, as an mp3 and not as a video those of you who have not seen these pictures the people that are sh- they're not football players <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> they might run over your face but it's a different context. in a car the, so, the yeah. uh the best twitter account uh it's super 70 sports they have the best best uh i'll we'll post Who's it in just a bit but he he had a post just the other day with a you know a guy who looked like 70s wear with a crop top football jersey out there like watering his lawn i think and he said every one of us knew this guy but somehow there's something different about it there are no football jerseys in any of these photos and you've got people complaining like um some men, like Joseph Damien, 22. Some men say the attention crop tops attract can be unwanted. He's a content creator in Fresno, okay? And he started to add the shirts to his wardrobe about three years ago, has been wearing them in public for about a year and a half. So he's wearing them privately for a year and a half. Yeah, for multiple years. Yeah. In public, public, people are talking to him and looking at his ridiculous shirt and he's saying, hey, I'm up here. Uh, you know, <laughs> eyes, please. Stop staring the at quote, my belly. The quote is, I've had people look at me weird because I'm wearing one. You think? You think? But the way out of it, just in case you were guys who were, were toying with it, you were thinking about going crop top adjacent, yeah. the way out of it is, the, he says, I feel like the way to actually rock a crop top is to just be confident. You just got to like, wear it loud, yeah. wear it proud, guys. Let it show. Like Chris Cuomo. Yeah. Put him out yes. there. I, I I agree with this, and I, and this I'm going to go somewhere here because now we know that on the cover of magazines, Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue, you know, uh, women's magazines, you have women of all shapes and sizes. Correct. This is where we, we are indeed. now. This is sometimes they're not even women, by the way, on the cover of the correct. swimsuit issue. But um, we don't see that on men's magazines. You don't mm. see like overweight men with their shirts off. Or in like short shorts. I'm saying Mm -hmm. we should. And I'm saying now is the time for those of us who are maybe a bit doughy in places. I want to be the cover (laughs) on the the cover of a magazine because I deserve it because I am proud of who I am, Megan. (laughs) I I support you fully. Fact check quickly. Mm -hmm. Prince Prince Fielder was on the cover. Uh, The body issue either of uh, of ESPN magazine or Sports Illustrated. Naked. Prince Fielder. Like 300. Prince Prince Fielder. Who's Prince Fielder? A lot of home runs. Yes, um, oh. uh, back in the day, and was a vegetarian. Weirdly, none of it made sense. Um, <laughs> yeah. he, the one exception there was one man. That was one man. But to your point, did, did you guys see the latest enrollee featured model in the Miami swimsuit? Not parade. It was like a fashion show. Look at this. Look. Mm. Okay, listening audience, it's a man. I don't know what's oh, happening with the lips. Oh. There's a serious issue with the lips. They make Kim Kardashian's lips look small, as does the ass makes Kim Kardashian's look small. A what? pink I don't bathing even know suit. What... Right. You know, wow. <laughs> just confused I can't faces. See what that is. Look at it again. Is that? Oh. But I, yes, it's a man. Oh. It's a oh. tucket bathing suit. Oh, Lord. 
Yes, oh. that's the right reaction. Yeah, I'm not okay with that, but... Um, mm -mm. Thong up uh. the bottom. <laughs> Featured as one of the big models at this year's Miami Swimsuit Runway Show. And it's, huh. it's, okay. it's a no. I mean, this... Yeah. Why? This person normally... I mean, they're... Like, maybe I sound mean, but I think there was something to the day and age when we shamed people like this too much to go out in public and parade down the runway. I, th I miss those days. Oh. You're, so you're you're calling for a, uh, a, a shaming period to come back again. <laughs> yes. um, you should get a red hat, Megan, that says make models hot again. Because <laughs> we, need a, we need a... I do want that. I'm not I'm saying that's me. I'm that. saying that's Megan Kelly. So when you report on that, that's her that has these horrible, horrible I... retrograde views. Want I don't like the, hot models. I like them ugly. I want the people wearing the women's swimsuit for the for the you know display whatever the runway to be women. That's what I want. Yeah. I don't want a man. I don't want chest hair. I don't want the big fake lips and the big big bottom all oh, fake wait, was and that manipulated. A man? Stop it. <laughs> was, yes. Was, was what? That a man? Are you joking? <laughs> what women has chest hair? Don't show it again. There was don't, a penis. Don't show it again. Please. No, Seriously we don't actually me. know what's going on down there. I mean, it could be. Oh, we know. Oh that's God. not a woman does it's not have. Oh my lord! I just looked. I saw what it's was a, going on down there. Holy <laughs> cow! It's a man, boy. Oh I my object. God! I didn't notice that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, now you now you want one of my hats, Megan? I don't see yeah. gender uh, until you showed the, <laughs> where the front was, and then I saw gender. <laughs> very explicitly saw gender. <laughs> It's very Can alarming, I, ask, uh, I have to say. A brief question yeah, about the, the New York Times and the state of affairs over there. I mean, is there any reason to suspect that coverage of the, the crop top uh, phenomena has something to do or can at least be correlated in an important way with the fact that they're abandoning their sports coverage? Yes. Like, mm. is, this, is this something that we should be reading into at all? That's interesting, right? Because they purchased uh, what's it called? The the uh, yeah, the athletic. athletic, yeah, the yeah. athletic, and they've decided no more New York Times sports reporters just going to go through them. So what you're saying is they're catering to a different kind of crowd now. They're not going to go sports. They're going to go crop top male males who aren't toxically masculine. And their well, sports coverage had a bit of a of a of a weird bent to it as well. As Matt would <laughs> Matt, Matt Welch uh, would uh, very routinely send us. Uh, the cover of uh, the sports page in the New York Times. I mean, Matt did this all the time, and he would just take a picture of this and send this to our our text change. And it would always be like, you know, decolonizing cricket or you know, uh, white supremacy <laughs> in speed skating. And it's like, wait, what? What is it? Is there a sports issue here? It's like, no, no, no. We're doing the thing for New York Times readers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> who hate sports. I have literally <laughs> never looked at the sports page of the New York Times. I get it delivered to my house every day, and I've never looked at the sports page. New it York Post. I will look at the They're sports. Really good. But so they wokeified even the sports page. Oh my god! Oh, not even. It was a an especially situation. Mm. Yes. It was oh. all like you know racial tensions at the women's wrestling high school, yeah. in Texas, like places that had nothing to do with New York that wasn't attracting any kind of national attention. You 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 damn well right. They're gonna write about that a lot. I mean, it actually started sort of in, on one sense with Howell Reigns, the former executive editor. He actually lost. He sort of bounced out because of his obsessive coverage oh, the, of the, the pastures yeah, golf. Yeah, that's right. in Augusta and whether the Augusta golf course allowed black people to be members or how long that it lasted. I forget the exact details. But he was just, which is an interesting story to write a, a few stories about. And he wrote like a, a, just it was a endless, scores. Yeah. Wouldn't wouldn't uh, stop yammering about it. But as someone who likes sports, baseball and basketball, especially, and likes sports writing when it's when it's great, um, I, I it it actually wounds me to see the LA Times just basically have, has boiled down its sports section to I think four pages inside some other section. They've cut off the deadline at three to three p.m. every day for a printer deadline. I grew up reading the LA Times sports: Jim Murray, uh, Bill Dwyer, uh, Mike Bresnahan, Ross Newman, all these guys, incredible, incredible Hall of Fame talent. Really got me excited about journalism and that stuff. Just uh, uh, just has died away for a lot of different conflicting reasons. But definitely the New York Times sports section has been aggressively trying to make you feel bad about liking sports for a really long time. Yeah. To Camille's mm -hmm. uh, point, I, though, I think that them purchasing the athletic and euthanizing their own sports people is a way to get around union rules because the athletic is a non-union shop. Um, and the athletic still covers sports mm. like it's uh, sports. Um, so maybe actually someone within the New York Times is like, hey, let's 
let's mix it up with some sports coverage. You know, <laughs> sports. Yeah. I, I, good thing. As always, I've got you because I, I I see you, I hear you in your struggle for a little inspo. And while you may not be finding it in the New York Times sports pages or LA Times sports pages, I have got just the remedy for you, Matt Welsh, and her name is Kamala Harris. She's got oh, thoughts yes. on what you might refer to <laughs> as culture. And I think this is going to make you feel a lot better. Take a listen. Great. Well, I think culture is, it, it is a reflection of our moment and our time, right? And, and, and <laughs> present culture is the way we express how we're feeling about the moment. And, oh, and we should always find times to express how we feel about the moment. That is a reflection of joy because, you know, it comes in the morning. <laughs> we have, we have to find what? ways to also <laughs> express the way we feel about the moment in terms of just having language and, and, and a connection to how people are experiencing life. And I think about it in that way, too. Huh? Huh? As my <laughs> Nana Teva used to say, huh? Why did no one intervene when there was somebody on stage <laughs> having a stroke? That seems to be rather rude. Good Lord. What that is the best morning. description? I mean, we should do contests on the fifth column of uh, Kamala Harris. He's like, you know, food is the thing that you put in your mouth. It is t- tasty. <laughs> it is food. It is calories. It's just like she's describing what culture kind of is, but not even really. And then just ramble. Wow, that was amazing. That's one of my favorite. Culture is how Lord. you feel about the moment. Oh, by the way, as you know, it's not her first time with the total... No fail mm. in offering a profundity of any kind. And my crack team in between watching The View and Chris Cuomo put this lovely 60 seconds together. I think you're really going to enjoy it. Oh, Watch. no. <laughs> it is time for us to do what we have been doing, and that time is every day. We all believe that when we talk oh, cool. about the children of the community, <laughs> they are a children of oh. the community. Um, talking about the significance exactly. of the passage of time. <laughs> Right. The significance of the passage of time. So when you think about it, there is great significance to the passage of time. I am here standing (laughs) here on the northern flank, on the eastern flank, because we have the ability to see what can be unburdened by what has been. And then to make the possible actually happen to see the moment in time in which we exist and are present and to be able to contextualize it, to understand where we exist in the history and in the moment as it relates not only to the past but the future. But let's always take a moment to also see what we have achieved thus far while we clearly Mm -hmm. see the moment that we are presently in. So we have achieved a lot. (laughs) <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> That's exactly what I was saying. She just repeats oh it. God. When you drive the car, you yes. get in and you go yes. to the location because you're in the car and you're driving there. It's yeah. like, what? It's unbelievable. <laughs> I have, she's Lord. incredible. She's incredible. The master of tautology. It's the best thing <laughs> ever right? in American politics. She has a thing that she's good at. This is what she's good at. It's amazing. Right. May, long may she reign. I never want her to go anywhere. Right? I, I love listening to her. Her and Karine Jean Pierre. They're they're cut from yes. the same cloth. You know, just act, actually saying absolutely nothing with tons of words skill. toward that end. It is a skill. Mm-hmm. It shouldn't be underestimated. It's a skill. It could be of one of those you, like, you uh, sure- uh, sleep apps, you know, like looks the rainforest. <laughs> never you know, she just sort of like is saying this. The yeah. wall is the space. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. what is it? Lore. ASMR where she's whispering just <laughs> this words. Around. I have yeah. a new theory um, based on watching that video, the great uh, put together video, and I hope that people will YouTube this if you're listening. Otherwise, um, uh, that your staff put together. Um, watch her hands, which are very mm. active hands. I mm-hmm. here, this is a little bit out there theory, but me and RFK Jr. have been talking about it. Um, and <laughs> it is that she's been taken over by some kind of like uh, like the real Kamala is inside, but she's been taken over by some like alien or some AI technology or something. And when the hands are really starting to go, that is the interior Kamala trying to get our attention and saying, help. It's a cry for help. <laughs> Matt, the problem with your theory is that AI is smart. 
Ah, and yes. that's the problem, right? <laughs> it's written right into it the name. Possibly be that. The one thing I did notice about that clip is that um, I was in Warsaw and I was about to meet the president, President Duda, and they canceled it because Kamala Harris was in town. And you showed a clip of that day where I was yeah. cooling my heels in the presidential palace, true story, in Warsaw waiting. And they were like, I'm sorry, Kamala Harris is here. And so rather than get a penetrating interview with the president of Poland, he had to sit next to a woman and he was like, I thought I spoke English. What is happening? I, I mean, right, right. am I not? Do I guess I don't speak this, English? And this, that's what that's, instead of talking to me, that's what he had to do. It's an embarrassment. <laughs> it's an embarrassment. Like, so we'll laugh at this because it's obvious drivel. But where, like the left-wing press, they don't like her. No, Even the Democrats don't like her. But remember mm. what they did to Dan Quayle? She's not getting that treatment by the press. They still, Georgia, we still, every Bush, once yeah. in a while, give it like another six months and you'll get the hit piece on why we're all sexists and misogynists and racists for having any fun at her expense whatsoever. And that all these criticisms come from our bigotry at base. But they have done it. I mean, they're doing it They're doing it now, but they do it not in the way that they did with Dan Quayle or with George mm -hmm. W. Bush, is that they do the drip, drip, drip. I mean, there was a story about the turnover in her office. I mean, there was a story the other day in, in, in Politico about Joe Biden's anger issues. And I mean, mm, Joe Biden's been in, in, in politics for many, 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 many years. This mm -hmm. has been long known. If you look at books mm -hmm. from, you know, recounting the Obama presidency, there was a couple of references to this. People talking about how Joe Biden was like very difficult to deal with and he'd start yelling at people, et cetera. It never, it's never talked about until the time then there's a certain number of people who think it should be talked about. And I think those are the people that, number one, don't want her on the ticket. And number two, kind of know that he's a problem as a candidate and the machine of the DNC is not going to allow that. So you see these little stories that come out. Those come out, those are, uh, those are sources from the White House. The same thing was true with the Kamala Harris story in the New York Times about, you know, how she's out to lunch and how, you know, there's a huge staff turner and no one really likes her, that sort of thing. Those are all very targeted. Everything in politics is targeted. It's like a film. Every frame in a in a film, it's there for a reason. They set there, they set it up for a very long period of time. And when you when you see these stories about Kamala, they don't come out and do it the way they did it with George Bush and and um, Dan Quayle, which is ridicule because that you can never come back from. This is a kind of the controlled right. opposition from the inside, and they do that with her. It's true. It's it's much less damaging to say she or he um, is an angry bitch or bastard. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's less damaging to say that than to say, oh my God, she's an idiot. I mean, honestly, yes. I I gave her the benefit of the doubt. I did not think she was an idiot. I now think she's a moron. She's just, she's not that smart. I mm -hmm. Forgive me, I'm still one of those people who gets wooed by titles. I'm like, she was the attorney general of the state of California. You know, like mm -hmm. how dumb could she be? Like dumb, the answer is very, very dumb is the answer. And I've come to that conclusion just with my own eyes and ears from watching and listening to her. She cannot put two sentences together. I mean, the old man is actually losing his mental faculties. She's just not a smart person. And it concerns me because that's all we have in line of the Democratic side. And as Trump's numbers continue to go up and up and up, and I realize some of the polls are showing him beating Joe Biden now in a hypothetical matchup, um, he's still very vulnerable. <laughs> he did not win in 2020. And it looks like it's going to be the same matchup. And honestly, Joe Biden's knocking on, you know, the Grim Reaper's door. And she mm. could be the president of the United States in the next six years by default if, if things go, you know, in, in a dark and upsetting way. I'm concerned. I yeah, they're, have they're, a, right. Go ahead, Matt. No, you, please. Well, there are very few people that I like in American politics anyways, um, and she's <laughs> certainly not one of them. Um, but I have n zero doubt whatsoever at this point that if anything were to happen to Joe Biden or if he were to decide, you know what, I'm not going to do this. I have just not. They would find someone else, Gavin Newsom, to run <laughs> as yeah, quickly exactly. as possible right, right. and yeah. push them to the forefront. There, there is doesn't seem to be any meaningful constituency for Kamala Harris. And the fact is that even when she became the president's pick for VP, it wasn't necessarily because he thought that there was this expectation that she would be so helpful on his ticket, apart from being generic, prominent black woman. That is what we were promised before mm -hmm. he selected her, not selected because of her qualifications, selected, but I suppose her qualifications in this particular case were the shape and shade of her genitalia, which, I mean, that is offensive on its face. I shape have two and theories shade that of her overlap. genitalia. Sure. Wow, that was, a, that was a line. She's got a 41% yes. approval rating, 56%. Dis <laughs> who are the 41% who approve of Kamala Harris? I mean, honestly, I wonder. I don't Man, know. Those are people who just don't want to say the wrong thing when the pollster calls. Go ahead, Matt Welsh. 
Two theories are one that Americans right now are getting the politics that they deserve good and hard. I blame all of us for everything. Um, and then two, <laughs> that Kamala Harris uh, is the most spectacular example of uh, failing up in American politics. I don't think that you can find mm -hmm. a single someone who's who's very bad at running campaigns managed to uh, win a lot of them and be plucked and put as a vice president. That's that's fantastic and has shown no uh, dazzle or sizzle as a public official. So those two things are going to combine. Um, I think whatever your worst case scenario is for American politics is the likeliest one. So for me, um, it is people are going to be petrified. Democrats are going to be petrified of having anybody uh, seen as competing either with Kamala Harris or Joe Biden. That's why only RFK Jr. and Marianne Williamson, who's polling at 6%, uh, which never was within shouting distance of before, um, are in the race and polling pretty high. Um, so what's going to happen is no one will challenge Biden. He'll win the nomination. He will fall down again and this time have a really hard time getting up. Uh, meanwhile, it's too late to kind of change the ballot. Everyone knows it's going to be Kamala Harris. Donald Trump, meanwhile, is in jail. Um, and he'll, of course, win in the primary in jail. I'm yeah. the worst case scenario here. <laughs> okay. um, he wins the primary in jail. So it'll be Donald Trump uh, with a Republican nomination in jail versus basically Kamala Harris, who nobody likes. Oh, um, my God. And, and I think we're it's uh, uh, Cornell West and RFK Jr. will have a Green Party, uh, Libertarian <laughs> Party unity ticket. Um, I, and I can that's get behind what we're it. going to get in 2024. I don't think, but just as a as a point, I don't think Donald Trump has any chance of being in jail Worst case scenario for him at the time of the actual election. I, think, I don't think so. You know, either, it's very just, easy to delay. Case. It's very easy to delay, especially a criminal case. You know, it's the defendant who normally wants a speedy trial. They can keep kicking this down the line. They can keep coming up with motion practice. The New York courts are famously overburdened and take a long time to decide motions. And I think that they can stop that trial in New York from even happening prior to the election. And for sure, the federal mm. trial is not happening anytime before 2024. So I just don't think, I think if anything, if he was going to be tried, it might happen after he was either elected or lost uh, in 2024. You know, by, the, becomes you know the by the rocket docket theory, that's, that's. There's not a rocket docket in New York. That's, about in, Florida? that's in Virginia. No, oh, no. Down yeah. in Miami. Are you kidding? Down in Miami where he is, a rocket docket is in Virginia. But the, the, okay. the one in Miami is going to take longer than the one in New York, and not just because it was brought a couple months later. It's, there's going to be tons of litigation on what's classified, what's not classified. What access can we provide to the jurors? What documents can they see? What documents can they not see? Does it, do they need security clearance of their own? How are we going to get them that? There, that's going to, Andy McCarthy's been talking about this, who tried the blind shake case, the guy who bombed the World mm. Trainers, Trade Center the first mm. time. And he's been saying like that, that alone, it was a dumb move for Jack Smith to even interject that. He should have just gone for obstruction. You know, like we gave him a subpoena, he didn't comply. As opposed to yeah. injecting the whole classified documents, well, sort of re related issue into it because that's going to take forever. And I really don't, and no federal court case goes particularly fast. So I, d I just don't think he's going to get tried on any of that prior to either becoming the president or losing the presidential race. And if he does run and lose, or if another Republican runs and loses, then Donald Trump is in a whole host of trouble. He's in a lot of trouble because I do think a New York yeah. jury, even though that case is a joke, might hate him enough to convict him. I don't think the and, federal cases. Uh, yeah, and that's an Andy McCarthy who's been very, very critical of Trump on a lot of these issues. One would m not expect that. I mean, I, he's been not been partisan about this. Um, one thing I want to say about, about the Democrats, I mean, it is really, really important to remember this data point that has been shown over and over again in polling that a majority of Democrats do not want Joe Biden to run. This is rather important if you're sitting in the, the DNC and if you're looking at these numbers. And as you pointed out, Megan, Donald Trump, uh, who lost the 2020 election, his, you know, his, his favorables have never been good. And um, it's close. It shouldn't be close. It's, you know, the old uh, sketch <laughs> with John Lovitz on SNL when he was playing Mike Dukakis and he turns around and he says, I can't believe I'm losing to this guy. Yeah, that yeah, is yeah, yeah. kind of the point of like, I, how, how is this happening? Because what you would expect in something like this is some sort of leak about certain people in the Democratic Party. And I have a fe feeling as to why this isn't happening, because the opposition are nut bars like Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib and mm -hmm. AOC, et cetera. But you would mm -hmm. imagine there'd be somebody in there that's leaking a story about how there is a small group of people, powerful people, that are going to Joe Biden and saying, you got to step back. You, everybody remembers 
that those two lines from LBJ in 1968, right? Um, I will not seek nor will I accept the nomination mm -hmm. of my party for the president of the United States. And he said that in 1968 for very good reason. And also you can remember 19, was it 1973 when Barry Goldwater took that walk over the White House. Barry Goldwater, Mr. Conservative, and said to the president, "You had, it was four, that he walked over and said, you got to resign. This is not looking good for you. You got to go. And that was the culmination of a lot of Republicans coming and saying that. Where are the Democrats right now who just for their own sake of survival – are not going to Joe Biden and saying, I mean, is the wall around him that strong and that great? Apparently it is. And that is like a suicide of the party in a way, if they're going to run somebody who can barely get through his first term, much less I can't imagine him getting through a second. Do we know like by when as a practical matter, they'd really have to do that. You know, like if they could possibly persuade him to step down and to take his number two with him and sub in Gavin Newsom. Do we know by when realistically they would have to do that to get you know, Gavin Newsom on the ballot and to get him with a head of steam going into Iowa, which of course won't be the first. Now South Carolina is gonna be first on the Dem side come January of 24. Like anybody know? I mean, it's just a matter of, I mean, they wore the delegates at the primaries and caucuses. So it's just when there's a, it, it has to do with whatever the deadline is for filing to get them in. Um, and I think that varies by state. Um, so uh, presumably you could do it in March, in, in April still, uh, before the first Super Tuesday, uh, depending on whether there's a long filing uh, uh, backlog deadline. So it, it can be, you know, I think practically it would have to be in November or or uh, October or December. There would have to be, there, someone is planning this out. My God, besides mm -hmm. Gavin Newsom, someone mm -hmm. is clearly planning this out, <laughs> has to be wargaming a strategy. But again, since we're getting the politics that we deserve, maybe they're just somehow not. They just are trying to, to squinch their eyes shut and make it all go away and that people will rally to Joe just like they did in the last primary campaign. And that's a that's a foolish approach to take because this isn't very foolish. Yeah. the last primary mm -hmm. campaign. People are not animated by the same uh, crazy uh, like fear and lockstep kind of dynamics to get rid of Donald Trump because he's not in office anymore. He's less of a threat. So you're not going to be able to sort of back the the seemingly normal guy. Also, the seemingly normal guy looks less and less normal by the day. So, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. someone should be doing this, but it's the Democratic Party right now. So who knows? Maybe they're not. Wouldn't it be amazing well, if it was Gavin Newsom? Because then you, you would have the ex-husband of his opponent's daughter-in-law. Is that is that right? Yeah. That would be rather yeah. odd, right? Vision. Well, they're not married. Don Jr. and Kimberly aren't married, but they're, oh, they're you know, not they've been married. together for oh, five they're... plus years. Okay. Yeah. No, but oh. yeah, I mean, she's obviously a campaign figure. And yes, yeah, she's been yeah. together I mean, with Don Jr. It would just be an Jr. odd thing, right? She's, she was the first lady of California, or San Francisco, yes. when she was married to San Francisco Mayor Gavin Newsom. And now, you know, who knows? Don Jr., he polls pretty well in some of these polls. He could be the future president. She could be the first lady of the United States someday. It's a big swing. It's a big swing. Now, listen, one of the things Joe Biden might be doing in order to keep himself alert and a little bit more spry in the White House could be— cocaine. Could be. Could be. I, I, I don't, we don't think it's him, <laughs> but it's still a mystery whose cocaine it is. We don't know. Uh, and now the Secret Service is holding a briefing Thursday morning to update us. Trump, who I realize he tweets out truth, truths out a lot of stuff, but he did live in the White House for four years, uh, is saying there's no way the Secret Service doesn't already know whose it is. There's Great. no way. And I tend to believe Trump on that. I tend to agree with him on that. But listen to Corinne Jean-Pierre and, and how indignant she is when she gets asked, can you just say explicitly that it doesn't belong to a Biden? Listen to this. Can you just say once and for all whether or not the cocaine belonged to the Biden family? There has been some irresponsible reporting uh, about the family. <laughs> and uh, and so I got to call that out here. And I have been very clear. Yeah. I was clear so, uh, two days ago when talking about this over and over again as I was being asked a question. As you know, and media outlets reported this, the Biden family was not here. They were not here. They were at Camp David. They were not here Friday. Wrong. They were not here Saturday. They were not here Sunday. They were not even here Monday. They came back on Tuesday. Mm. So to ask that question is actually incredibly irresponsible. And and um, I'll just leave it there. Okay. Hell of a dodge. Hell of a, Hell dodge. Of a dodge. Didn't hear the word no.
Didn't hear the word. It's not theirs. Did not hear those words. Also, they left on Friday, I think, like 6.30 or 7. So it they could were. be one of they them. They were in yeah. the White House I mean, on so Friday. That's actually yeah. the, the irresponsible, quote unquote, irresponsible question was met by a lying answer. So um, mm -hmm. just typical politics, I guess. Phil Houston, the spy, the lie guy who ran, he created and ran the CIA's deception detection program for 25 years. He says one of, one of the many signs of lying is when you attack the question itself, right? Like mm -hmm. it, as opposed to just being like, yes, I can say it wasn't theirs. You've got to say, mm -hmm. that's incredibly irresponsible of you to even ask it. And then list a long days, a list, a, a long list of days in which they weren't at the White House. And even your list is a lie, right? Like a lot of lying went on in that 60 second answer she just gave right there, which tells us something. I don't know if it tells us it's the Bidens, but at least Corinne Jean-Pierre, I think has her doubts. I've always been curious about her and just the way that she does her job. I mean, for me, if I was doing her job, it, it feels like a much better response to that is, look, I, I get it. I'm not going to entertain this ridiculous speculation. The Secret Service is looking into this. They're investigating it. They will have yes. their announcement later this week. And if you if you want to indulge in preposterous speculation about the Biden family, be my guest. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to do it from this lectern. But that would is be the it correct way of doing it, yeah. Is it preposterous? Preposterous. I, I, I submit to the jurors. I mean, that's what she should jurors. say. I didn't yes, say but I, I would. I, could tell I know the there are the hundreds. is a crackhead, so no, well, it's not. <laughs> and unless you wonder, like, is it really as bad as we think it is with Hunter Biden? Was he really that bad off? I give you the following nugget from just a couple, like a year plus ago nugget. when he was going on his book tour. <laughs> I think we called them rocks, Megan. Yeah. I spent more time on my hands and knees, picking through rugs, um, smoking anything no. that re even remotely resembled crack cocaine. I probably smoked more Parmesan cheese than anyone, <laughs> anyone that you know, I'm sure, Tracy. <laughs> because there'd be crumbs mixed in and yeah, you just... It, yeah, I mean, I went one time for 13 days without sleeping and smoking crack and drinking vodka exclusively throughout that entire time. By the way, wow. that guy is saying that the mother of little Navy Joan wasn't the dating type. How, how, what are you? <laughs> <laughs> what are you, sir? He's a real catch. He's a real catch. He's devoted. He's, he's resourceful, <laughs> Megan. He finds cocaine yeah. in the Parmesan or whatever. That always, uh, Who, I'm going to be looking at my craft in the freezer, a refrigerator, a totally different way. Like, what, what the hell? I was wow. just sprinkling it on pasta. Yeah, I don't know if that is a vindication uh, uh, of him or not, because he clearly does lose drugs, but he also quickly finds them. So maybe he <laughs> wouldn't have left it at the White House. But I have to say, as somebody who worked as a, as a journalist in D.C., um, I don't think he's the only candidate, because it is not uh, something uh. that is rare that you don't see around. You do um, actually, not to sound like Madison Cawthorn, remember him? Um, yeah. But, you know, there's a lot of uh, cocaine and uh, stuff around and uh, but the thing about it is, is that, you know, as Trump said, there are a lot of cameras in the White House. And if there aren't a lot of cameras in the White House, probably there should be because they're like the ones that I have around my house are like twenty five dollars. They don't cost a lot. Mm -hmm. So maybe mm -hmm. you should have cameras in the White House and, you know, probably figure this out pretty quickly. Uh, who's this? But who loses cocaine? Good Lord. I know. Who I, takes cocaine this, into this, the White House to begin with? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Maybe I would, but um. that's kind of a win, uh, for being honest. <laughs> the dude celebrating their W's. But uh, uh, actually, as a fifth column listener, who apparently, uh, like M Michael Moynihan, has some uh, at least oh, reportorial knowledge of cocaine. It's only uh, reportorial. Yeah, yeah. Um, the <laughs> listener said, as a former uh, coke head myself. Um, mm -hmm. I got to say, everyone pointing the finger at Hunter is getting a thing wrong. Uh, a a cokehead's gonna gonna know where all the coke is, and he's not gonna leave any left over. Like he's gonna he's going to be a human vacuum. So cleaner. then, how did it get so, there? Get this. An am I think he's saying an amateur of some, an amateur. somebody who's not exactly. a seasoned uh, addict, like, a dabbler. Like <laughs> I see a dabbler. Okay, okay. Well, we'll find out what the Secret Service has to say on Thursday. But it certainly seems to me like this is going the way of the Supreme Court leaker. Uh, you know, we investigated. Yeah. It was just too tough a case to crack. Pardon the pun. Um, you know, further updates to follow, and then it just completely quiets, so gets quiet. Now, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about this story I've been wanting to get to now for days, and it, it may be the best story of the week. It has to do with the New York mayor, Eric Adams. You may think you're not interested in the New York mayor, but you will be interested in this bizarre 
story uh, breaking just over the past couple of days on him. Stand by. More with the fifth column, guys, after this quick break. All right, guys, this is an incredible story. Uh, New York City, uh, thank God, got rid of Mayor de Blasio. He couldn't run again because of term limits. And they voted in Eric Adams. And people thought, okay, you know, he's a former cop. Anything's better than de Blasio. Maybe he'll be pro-cop. Well, that's not exactly how it turned out to be. There's a soft on crime crime prosecutor, Alvin Bragg. Soft on crime, unless your name is Donald Trump. And... um, we had defunding of the police and all sorts of the same issues in New York City as we've seen in many other big cities. And unfortunately, they instituted a policy where they were no longer going to pursue the death penalty or uh, severe penalties for people who kill police officers. And shortly around that t- or after that time, two cops got killed, Officer Wilbert Mora and Jason Rivera back in February 2022. And Wilbur- Wilbert Mora's sister made headlines when she spoke at his funeral, which were, was covered by us and everybody else, saying how many more police officers have to die. They protect us, but who protects them? Who watches for their lives? And it became a big thing, especially for Mayor Eric Adams. Now, in the wake of this firestorm, Eric Adams um, started to tout his cop credentials and said that he wanted, that the loss of these officers reminded him of the 1987 line of duty death of one of his friends, Officer Robert Venable. At a news conference at City Hall, shortly after this, Adams said, I still think of Robert. I keep a picture of him in my wallet. A week later, Mayor Adams posed for a photograph for a portrait in his office holding a wallet-sized photo of Officer Venable uh, after the New York Times had requested to see the photo. Mr. Adams brought up the photo, quoting here from the New York Times, which broke this story. Mr. Adams brought up the photo in at least two television interviews last April as well, saying, I understand the pain. I carry around a picture of Robert Venable, my close friend, who was shot several years ago during my early days as a cop, and I always have Robert's picture. The pain never dissipates. Times points out he's repeated the moving antidote many times, um, including at the police academy uh, where they were graduating last June and so on. Great story, except it's not true. It appears to be a total lie. And unbelievably, and to its credit, the New York Times broke that piece of this story too. They tell us that the weathered photo of Officer Venable had not actually spent decades in the mayor's wallet. It had been created by employees in Mayor Adams' office in the days after Mr. Adams claimed to be carrying it in his wallet. Listen to this. His employees were instructed to create a photo of Officer Venable according to a person familiar with the request. Listen to this. A picture of Officer Venable was found on Google. It was printed in black and white and made to look worn as if the mayor had been carrying it for some time, including by splashing coffee on it, said the person who spoke on condition of anonymity for fear of retribution. The person who directly ordered the altered photo to be created, according to the person familiar with the matter, said she had no comment when called by the Times and asked about all of this. Finally, the mayor's office, confronted by the Times for comment, uh, a Fabian Levy, spokesperson for the mayor, insisted that Adams had carried a photo of the officer for decades and provided the names of several former transit police colleagues who said in an interview that Adams and Officer Venable had indeed been friends, which is a little different than saying Mm -hmm. he'd had that photo on him in his wallet. And then the spokesperson criticized the Times for what he characterized as a campaign to paint the mayor as a liar. Uh, Mr. Levy ignored repeated requests to elaborate about the authenticity of the photo He did not respond to questions about whether the photo was made to look old, in part by staining it with coffee. Guilty. He is guilty. He did it. Mm. It's obvious. Mm -hmm. It's disgusting. And, you know, kudos to the Times for breaking it. But what does this tell us about Mayor Eric Adams, the new great hope for New York City? Tells me that (laughs) he should resign. (laughs) <laughs> uh, I, I think there should, there should be a one. Remember those three strikes and you're out uh, little things. I think for politicians, one strike like this and you should be out. One of the 
one of the few advantages that uh, my home state of California has uh, over uh, other states uh, or some other states is that at least we have a recall mechanism. And sometimes we even use it. We can recall a politician who's just a douchebag or does some very malfeasant thing. And that's totally a word. Um, and this for me is that this is such a, a piece of uh, sociopathic behavior. It's exactly what Moynihan was talking about before, the way that politics absolutely corrupts everything. Your basic human interaction and decency. A guy who's going to lie about this will lie about literally anything. This is one of the problems I've had with Donald Trump from the beginning is that he will lie for no reason at all about things that don't matter. And that to me is a human failing. And I don't want that in a leader anywhere uh, for him to do this in the service of trying to portray himself as something that he is not, to try to respond to a human tragedy that happened on or near his watch. Um, it's it's so grotesque. There aren't really any words for it. I think the broader uh, thing that it points to besides the personal uh, pathological nature of it is that there have been some um, uh, signs electorally of a backlash against the way that big city democratic cities are run, right? You had recall elections in San Francisco of Ch Chesa Boudin, of three of the uh, school board members there. Uh, you've had some reversals even in Portland, Oregon, of some of the excesses there. Eric Adams was kind of a backlash candidate. Um, but none of this is really, none of those efforts have really coalesced into someone with a program. It's not like there's some kind of Manhattan Institute. Uh, adjacent to centristy democratic politicians saying, okay, well, here's what you actually do for governance of these places that have been mismanaged and that you campaigned on the excesses, which he totally did. Um, so there is reason to be uh, happy that he won and that he was a, uh, a kind of expression of this. But going in, you could tell that he was an erratic person, prone to personal corruption, weird, um, like dodgy about where he lived and who he was dating um, and didn't really have a program for governance. So I wish this was more surprising, but it's not. This is disgusting. I mean, really, it's disgusting to say this is true when it's not. And by the way, he was asked about it yesterday. And the, see if you can make sense of what the hell he is saying. What this, this soundbite shows me is he's lying again. Listen. The Sat 22. appearance that was trying to be created that we were not friends was really amazing. Robert was a friend. It was very painful when I lost him. We asked whether the photo had been fabricated. Okay, uh, for all right. Do you have another question? I put, out a, I put out a statement and I responded to that and given credibility to what was done in a very painful, was brought up to all of us, of that painful moment of losing Robert. Wow. He's a liar. Wow. He's a liar. It's not even yeah. a, a lie. A truth teller he's says even, he's just dodging. I mean, yeah. it's, right. It's, I mean, it's a truth graceful. teller says it's true. I had it. The New York Times report is bullshit. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. No, that's that's what you say if you're telling the truth. Um, I, <laughs> exactly. At least in this particular <laughs> instance, he didn't he decide didn't decide that this was an opportunity to to challenge someone and insist that they think they're talking to someone down on the plantation down on the yeah. plantation. And yes, it's exactly. Not respect which happened this week um, too. So that dodge yeah. is gone. Yeah, and if yeah, and if people miss that, uh, Mayor Adams. Uh, told a, a Holocaust survivor that she was like a plantation owner. Um, <laughs> an 80-year-old, 80 80-plus-year-old 80 woman who was talking about the rent being too damn high, a, a, a frequent <laughs> refrain in New York City. And he's like, and asking, know, what are you going to do about it? Well, the funny thing is that it, it, it was very imperial because he said, don't yeah. wag your finger at me. I, I'm yeah. in a position of authority. You don't do that Do we have time to, to play it? Who do you think you are? Do we have time to play it? Let's let's listen to it. It's crazy. I demand respect. Listen. Why in New York City, where the real estate is controlling you, Mr. Mayor, why are we having these horrible rent increases last year and this year? If you're going to ask a question, don't point at me and don't be disrespectful to me. I'm the mayor of this city and treat me with the respect that I, would, I deserve to be treated. I'm speaking to you as an adult. Don't stand in front like you're treating someone that's on the plantation that you own. Give me the respect I deserve. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Unbelievable. All those Holocaust survivors that own plantations. And they applaud him. <laughs> they <laughs> applaud him, too. Yeah. 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 Be a man. Yeah. Be a grown-up. Let your constituents yell at you. It's part of the job. Uh, demand respect. Mm -hmm. Oh, could you stop? Just stop it. Guys, that was fun. <laughs>
It's super was fun, fun talking today, as always. And by the way, we're going to have an extra for you with the guys, Camille, Michael, and Matt. And you know where you can see it? If you're a regular listener or viewer, you may have heard me talk to you about MeganKelly.com. We send you there to sign up for my weekly American News Minute, right? For our email on Fridays. Well, now there's a whole lot more. We just officially launched MeganKelly.com as a real website. And we're going to post a little extra with the guys there. And now our hope is that this can be your one-stop shop for everything related to the show, the news, and what's going on in our world, and including my world, including my naughty dog, Strudwick, and his shenanigans. It remains the most clicked-on item in our newsletter. In fact, Strudwick has his very own section of the newsletter and of the website as per your popular demand. So it's easy for you to keep up with all the latest news and news about him. My team and I are publishing new articles and videos from the show and other news stories every day. We'll have some behind the scenes content for you. Uh, You may have started to see some of this on our social media channels and in our Friday email called the American News Minute. But go check it out. I think you're gonna enjoy it. And if you like the show, you're gonna love the website. We've designed it so that you can easily find the full episode archive. A lot of our our viewers have said, how how can I find the archives? It's too difficult to find. Just go to Megan Kelly, just go to MeganKelly.com and you will find all the archives easily easily searchable of The Megyn Kelly Show, both in video and podcast form, plus some memorable, funny, inspirational moments from earlier shows that you may have missed or would like to revisit. Meg Storm, she's been working on it nonstop. We got a lot of Megs here. Meg Storm has been working on it nonstop, and she's very talented, and she has a nice eye for how to make things user-friendly. You're going to like it. MeganKelly.com is going to be home to exclusive content from me and from friends of the show as well, including the fifth column guys who will be recording a special segment for the site with me in two minutes as soon as we sign off. I read your emails, and so many of you have been asking for a destination like this for some time. So I'm super excited to be able to bring it to you. Eventually, we're going to create sort of a fan interaction piece of this so we can talk behind the scenes as well. Uh, And it's just our way of sort of thanking you for being loyal fans of the show, listeners, viewers, what have you. Thank you for making it all possible. Uh, And we'll chat more tomorrow.